Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, and welcome to this last uh, policy seminar of the year. Uh, I'm Elisa Cagliari. I work in Venice in the Natural Hazard Group, and today, together with Isabella and Lara, we're going to talk about uh, COP22, as we had the opportunity to take part in it. Um, I spent the whole two weeks in Marrakesh because I'm a bit uh, addicted to COPs, while uh, <laughs> Isabella and Lara spent some a, a week and a bit well, less. <laughs> And so the aim of this presentation is to review with you the main outcomes of uh, the Marrakesh conference and to reflect on them and also to answer to any curiosity you might have uh, and you would like to ask us as we took part in the, as observers in the negotiations. So we decided to structure the presentation in three interconnected parts. In the first part, which is under my responsibility, I will talk uh, about the main outcomes of the conference in terms of technical negotiations and also on some uh, political initiatives which are equally important to keep the Paris momentum up. And then uh, I will give the floor to Isabella and she is going to talk about finance which is fundamental, let's say, to make uh, the good intentions expressed in the Paris Agreement uh, come true, let's say, and uh, concrete. And then we're going to kind of uh, break the rules of the policy seminar because we're going to introduce also some research. And um, we all know that the INDCs are not enough to keep the, the temperature increase below 2 degrees. And so Lara will talk about how to make uh, NDCs uh, more effective, uh, specifically focuses on uh, transparency and domestic policies. So let's go into the negotiation bulletin. Uh, as you know, the conference took place in Marrakesh from the 7th to the 29th of November, and it saw the participation of 2,500,000 people. So it was uh, a bit less crowded than uh, the Paris. And it was the first uh, COP for uh, Patricia Spinoza, who's the new uh, executive secretary of the convention, the last one for Ban Ki-moon. And then the president was the foreign minister, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Morocco, Mauzar. I don't know how if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And um, and he he's really a charismatic guy in the sense that he didn't want um, Marrakesh to be remembered as the COP after Paris. So he really tried to keep uh, to to give um, the this COP um, a very strong political dimension. And he was also a funny guy with all the respect that we can give to our ministry. Uh, because, for example, in the plenary, in the closing plen plenary of the COP, we started to sing a happy birthday to the Mali delegate, and this was one of the, of the highlights, let's say, of the conference. But uh, COP22 was not important just because he really tried hard to give you uh, some relevance to the, the conference, but also because, as you know, the first agreement enter into force on the 4th of November. Uh, now we have uh, more than 100, no, we have 114 countries who ratified the agreement, and this number is growing every day. I had to change the slides a couple of times because every day you have a new country signing up. And, and this, of course, put Marrakesh in the spotlight because uh, at COP22, the decision-making body of the Paris Agreement was to convene for the first time. And then, of course, there are some also some preparatory work for the entry to for for Yes, Lisa, tell me. Closer to the microphone, please. It's very difficult to share. No, fine. Okay, so we'll sit down. <laughs> Can you hear me better now, Valen? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so basically I was saying that uh, the entry into force of the Paris Agreement put um, uh, COP22 in the, in the spotlight. And um, the main issue that the conference was asked uh, to, um, to realize, let's say, was the development of the Paris Agreement rulebook. So the development of all those operational uh, rules uh, that are um, uh, necessary, let's say, to implement the, the agreement's objective. So the important issue here is to move from the what has been decided in Paris to the how we reach these kind of objectives. And there are some important hows. 
So, for example, how parties uh, should communicate their efforts on mitigation, adaptation, climate finance, uh, technology uh, support and capacity building, how these efforts will actually be uh, reviewed and scaled up every five years through the global stock take, and how we can create a system uh, to facilitate the implementation and the compliance of these efforts. Then there were some other issues which were related, let's say, to the Paris Agreement and were discussed at COP22, like the issue of finance and capacity building. And then there were, of course, some other uh, topics which were inherited by previous uh, conference of the parties, like the issue of loss and damage and, and the Lima work program on gender. Before stepping into what uh, was actually decided, let me just briefly recall how these negotiations are organized and uh, also um, explain some of the acronyms we're going to use through the presentation. So basically, as you know, the uh, negotiations uh, last for two weeks. And the first week is devoted to technical, let's say, negotiations. While in the second week, what has been decided by technicians is kind of approved or not by the uh, political level. So what happens is that the COP, which is the uh, decision-making body of the convention, where the CMP is the decision-making body of the Kyoto Protocol, basically they approve the agenda and they send the forward some issues to uh, the technical bodies, which are the subsidiary body for implementation and the one for technological advice. Then they make negotiations and they go back to the COP for approval of what they have decided. But here, another important technical uh, body is the APA, which is the ad hoc working group uh, for the Paris Agreement, and he has a really important task of, the, of developing the rule book for the, for the agreement. And what, what is decided by the APA is to be approved by the CMA, which is the uh, decision-making body of the Paris Agreement. And um, one of the big issues, let's say, uh, at COP22 was what to do with the CMA because the entry into force of the agreement kind of forced uh, the convening of this first uh, session, but then what should we do with that? Should we close it? Should we adjourn it? Should we uh, um, reconvene it? So it was not very clear and this was one basically of the issue that was discussed at the, uh, at the COP level. So what to do with the CMA 1. And in the end what was decided is to kind of keep it open because the fear was that, that if you formally closed, let's say, this session, um, the Paris momentum would have been lost. So basically, uh, also from a psychological point of view, it was not really a good choice to make. And um, so they decided to divide it into three parts, and next year uh, the CMA will take stock of what has been done in terms of development of the rule book. And then in 2018, uh, it, will be, it will approve, let's say, uh, the rule book as a whole. Then there was another important thing uh, related to COP22, which was that of the orphan issues. So basically, there were some um, topics which were also very important, like uh, how to um, adjust um, the goal on finance, um, the, the definition of the common time frames for the NDCs, uh, the adjustment of the NDCs, and basically these items did not have an agenda. Uh, and so, uh, one of the issues to understand is, uh, was when to start a discussion and take uh, decisions on this issue. And so, some orphan issues were uh, forwarded, let's say, to the APA again, and while some other to other, the other technical bodies uh, within the convention that I was mentioning before. Then, uh, another hot topic during negotiations was that of the Adaptation Fund. Basically, the Adaptation Fund serves the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, so the issue was whether it should also serve the Paris Agreement. But it was not like a, a technical issue. It was uh, an important political one. Because, of course, not all the, the countries within the Kyoto Protocol are the same that are within the Paris Agreement. Take, uh, think, for example, to the US. But in the end, after very lively negotiations, um, it was decided to, that the um, adaptation fund will serve also the Paris Agreement. And then the fourth point which was discussed was that of the facilitative dialogue. This is a really important um, appointment that's going to take place in 2018. 
In BZP, it's a mini global stock take. The global stock take is the mechanisms through which the INBCs have to be updated and uh, increased, let's say, in ambition. And so there will be a preliminary edition before the, the actually, um, um, not entry to force, but um, the, the Paris Agreement taking effect after uh, 2020. Um, and uh, what was importantly decided was to kind of um, draft, uh, let's say, um, a path, let's, an organizational uh, path towards the, the organization of the facilitative dialogue. And then um, the other important thing was that uh, 2018 was elected, let's say, uh, as the year to have all this work done, which is a year after uh, the date, let's say, that was uh, hoped by developing countries, but actually uh, a year before what parties thought would have happened in Paris. So they gave uh, themselves kind of um, an ambitious, let's say, work plan for the years to come. And here we go even more technical, but not really going into the details. Uh, just to tell you that the development of the rule book is, uh, has begun. Uh, we don't have any substantial decision on that because they told you this will be finalized by 2018. What is interesting to note here is that um, really this negotiation highlighted how there are different understandings of what was decided in Paris. For example, one big discussion was around mitigation and the information to be included in the NDCs. And should it be qualitative, should it be quantitative, how do we take into account differentiation between developed and developing countries. And, and this was one of the issues where uh, parties fight the most, let's say, uh, during uh, negotiations. Um, but um, let's say, okay, we didn't have any concrete result on these uh, issues on mitigation, adaptation, transparency, and the global stock team. Discussion started, but what is important to note here is that they also gave themselves a clear work program uh, for the first part of 2017. Uh, now let's go to some issues that finally were uh, actually uh, operationalized and closed, let's say, in, in Marrakesh and that are related also to the Paris Agreement. In Paris, uh, it was decided to create um, a special committee on capacity building to support developing countries on this specific uh, issue. Uh, and this was uh, following Article 18, which recognizes uh, capacity development as a prerequisite for, the, um, for achieving the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. And so this uh, Paris Committee on Capacity Building was actually operationalized uh, in Marrakesh through the election of the members and through the is starting, let's say, of the of the work plan. Another um, topic which was uh, started to be finalized uh, was that uh, related to indigenous people. This is not an issue that really uh, captures the attentions when talking about climate negotiations, but indigenous people are really vocal, let's say, in climate talks. And uh, thanks to an initiative of the Moroccan presidencies, uh, it was decided to launch in Marrakesh the local communities and indigenous people platform, which is meant to provide um, yeah, a platform for the exchange of best practices and information um, among um, related to adaptation and mitigations uh, at the civil society level. So it's also a way to recognize uh, the role of civil societies within climate talks. And this picture is very nice because it's not taken by the internet, it was taken by us. Uh, at uh, Marrakesh, and these are two indigenous people we, we got to meet from Peru. Another... Um, um, does local community mean uh, also, I mean, for instance, our colleagues in uh, Basilicata? What does it well, mean local communities? Yeah, in, in general, it can, yeah, it can also mean local community in Basilicata as engaging adaptation activities and mitigation activities is not restricted to in, indigenous people, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's like... Um, but there is a definition who are in charge of uh, <laughs> use this, this kind of platform? Now, it's open to non-state actors, so it could be organization of 
indigenous people or, or civil society organization is not um, there's no strict definition for the time being because it was just launched. I don't know whether they will uh, approve at uh, terms of references where they will be more strict, uh, let's say, in defining it. But yeah, I, I think it's an issue for the. And what about the community settlement? I mean, uh, the, the one on, on uh, Tanzania, the Tanzanian community committee. Who are the members of the committee? Which kind of members? I mean. Uh, could no. be a member or not? No, these are our parties member. This is a state member. Yes, of course, of course. Ah. The state will nominate someone. Who? I mean, if uh, Italy, yeah, the, typically the Ministry of Environment appoints the delegates, but normally these are. Mm, it yeah, can also be technicians. Hmm? So, yeah, but these are parties members. Uh -huh. so I don't know where they come. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no member for Italy, but just no. because uh, Italy is, um, works through the European group. So there is a member from the European Commission? I, I can check that. I don't know if them by heart, but I can check it out. Uh, could be uh, um, also university academia, academic members and also research center. Yeah, yeah, but this is a nomination. Yeah, but this is a nomination up to the the ministry to the to the yeah. party person. Yeah, it's important to know who is the member. Yeah, but we can, we can. No, we can check it out afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Okay. No, but it's free. Okay. Moving to gender. Uh, in um, in Marrakesh, the Lima Work Program on Gender was extended. This was a um, an important work work program that was established at COP20, and it moves on two different levels. Uh, talking about gender. So it's about improving, improving the gender balance and participation into climate negotiation and into the same uh, bodies of the conventions. But then, of course, is uh, more widely to make a, um, gender consider well, um, gender balance, let's say, mainstreamed also in the, in, um, in the drafting and then in the implementation of, uh, of climate policies. And just to show you how gender issues are uh, not pretty resolved, also at the UNFCCC level, these are some data about uh, the gender of heads of party delegations, uh, taken from a report that the UNFCCC publishes every year. And uh, so you can see that the percentage of female head of delegations uh, hardly reached the 30%. And this is one of the... Um, most optimistic figures in the sense that, for example, if you take the membership of the uh, Clean Development Mechanism uh, board, you only have one woman out of uh, ten members. So it's um, good news, let's say, that the work program was extended for uh, three additional years. And then here we enter into the um, issues that uh, were inherited by previous uh, conference of the parties, and this is... Uh, one of my, let's say, research obsession, let's say, uh, uh, that is lost and damage associated with climate change impacts. So basically, it refers to the residual impacts from climate change after mitigation and adaptation. And in Warsaw, a, spe a specific uh, mechanism was put in place to cope uh, with this kind of impact. And um, it has been reviewed in Marrakesh, but the thing was that it was reviewed more from a procedural point of view, because it, a uh, periodical process of re review was established, but not really in the substance. So one of the main issues with loss and damage is, uh, should we provide some financial support to help uh, vulnerable developing countries to cope with these residual impacts? And this uh, issue, again, was not touched in, in Marrakesh again. As for climate migrants, which are also uh, dealt with, uh, let's say, uh, the loss and damage uh, topic. Well, uh, negotiations didn't really focus on it uh, in Marrakesh because uh, climate migrants were kind of secured by the Paris Agreement, 
uh, maybe an interesting thing that was uh, done before uh, before the, the Marrakesh talks was the establishment of um, this uh, task force on displacement under the Warsaw International Mechanism of Loss and Damage, which is aimed to advance uh, knowledge and action on this issue. And uh, from the political point of view, I guess you all got to, um, to hear the Marrakesh Action Proclamation. It's not really new in the sense that uh, it basically reiterates the non-controversial points of the Paris Agreement. Um, the only maybe interesting line is where it mentions the irreversible momentum for climate action, which was kind of read by some observers uh, as an indirect message to, uh, elected, to, to President uh, elect Trump, uh, not to stop, let's say, uh, the, the, the Paris momentum. But then, in the end, uh, um, the story behind, let's say, this proclamation is more interesting than the proclamation per se, because, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, the Moroccan presidencies tried to make the, um, the expectation, let's say, for COP22 pretty high, so they wanted to, to have this political declaration be, um, be, um, uh, be, be declared, let's say, uh, in the closing plenary, but what they did was to share the draft only with some groups of parties, and of course, developing countries were a bit. Uh, some developing countries were a bit um, angry with this choice, and and so in the end, they argued for the whole two weeks on how to make the the text more balanced. That from the original four pages, they cut down to one. And um, from the political point of view, maybe are more interesting the initiatives taken by, by states, uh, a lot of negotiations. And for example, um, the first long-term low carbon development strategies were put forward by the US, uh, Canada, Mexico, and Germany. Um, basically, in the case of Canada, US, and Mexico, they're not really uh, putting forward new goals for 2050. They're reaffirming the same goals uh, established during the G8 in 2009, and you can find the same goals in the NDCs. But what is new about these long-term strategies is that they at least uh, trace kind of a pathway to get to these uh, objectives. Although they underline there is not um, anything um, poly anything that can constrain the, their action. It's just starting a conversation on how to reach these uh, goals. And also a dedicated uh, platform for this kind of um, initiative was launched in Marrakesh. But it's not just uh, developed countries to put forward ambitious action, but also developing countries, like the Climate Vulnerable Forum, uh, has put forward this uh, pathway to 2050. And they also uh, declared they would go for 100 renewables uh, as soon as possible. This in terms of mitigation. In terms of adaptation, one interesting initiative was that of the adaptation of African Agriculture Initiative. This was strongly wanted, let's say, uh, by the Moroccan presidencies. And basically, it's about uh, putting agriculture, African agriculture at the heart of climate negotiations. It's uh, supported by 25 countries and UNFCCC and FAO. And uh, one of the big aims is to attract uh, uh, a substantial share of climate funds. And as we're talking about money, I leave the floor to, to Isabella to go more into the details. Okay, so um, I would like to update you on um, climate finance. So what uh, were uh, actually the progress made in, uh, in Marrakesh? And for doing this, I, I need to, to start from the Paris Agreement. So just to update you a little bit uh, also on what it was foreseen from the Paris Agreement uh, on climate finance. So um, Paris Agreement represents really a significant shift in the, in the ambition on, on climate finance because it calls for making finance flows consistent with the long-term pathways uh, towards uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction and climate resilience development. And uh, at Article 9, which is one on, on finance, um, calls for developed countries' parties to um, provide financial support to developing uh, uh, country parties with respect to both mitigation and adaptation. It doesn't stand, you know, clearly 50% each, but it stands both for mitigation and adaptation. 
So this is very important because adaptation was not considered in the in the previous uh, um, treaty. And um, so uh, and also not only stand for a clear um, goals, but also uh, the Paris Agreement set the framework for making these financial flows possible. So basically, um, it uh, decides that uh, uh, the Green Climate Fund and the, the Global Environment Facilities will be uh, will serve um, the Paris Agreement will make actually will be the body of the finance uh, financial mechanism serving the Paris Agreement, and um, the Green Climate Fund will devote this is made clearly will devote 50% to mitigation and 50% to adaptation. And uh, also stands for other operating entities serving the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement, which are the Least Developed Countries Fund and the Special Climate Change Fund. And last but not least, the Adaptation Fund, which is in the Paris Agreement um, is written that uh, the Adaptation Fund may serve the Paris Agreement, whereas finally at COP we will see what has been decided by the um, negotiating body of the Kyoto Protocol and uh, of the, in the first meeting of the negotiating body to the Paris Agreement. So uh, what is important to, um, to recall before starting uh, to update you on what happened in, uh, in Marrakesh is that uh, the Paris Agreement uh, said that prior to 2025, the conference of the parties uh, serving so the, the basically the negotiating body of the Paris uh, uh, Agreement, the CMA, should set a new collective uh, uh, quantified goal from the floor of uh, 100 billion per year US dollar, and uh, taking into account both uh, mitigation uh, and adaptation um, and the needs for uh, um, developing countries. And uh, uh, just to make uh, the first, uh, the first, um, let's say, uh, statement is in the Paris Agreement. Uh, sorry, in Marrakesh, uh, this uh, new uh, collective quantified goal was not uh, decided yet. Indeed, uh, as we've seen already, Elisa showed us that the Marrakesh Action, Marrakesh Action Proclamation, uh, actually recalled and reaffirmed the uh, U.S. Uh, the 100 billion mobilization goal which is actually the goal, is a, a goal per year by 2020. So there's not any news on, uh, on, this, uh, on this mobilization goal, which is the global goal that uh, calls, uh, as I recall, from um, that the Paris Agreement calls uh, developed countries to um, flow to developing countries in order to, um, to reach uh, the goal set by the Paris Agreement. So um, the Marrakesh Action Proclamation, though, um, calls for an increase in the volume, flow, and access to finance, uh, without uh, uh, also um, um, focusing um, basically on the capacity and technology building, so calling for uh, technology know-how exchange <coughs> and capacity exchange, but without uh, giving any new set uh, goal uh, on, uh, on the global uh, mobilization goal. Um, on the other side, the Marrakesh Partnership for a Global Climate Action, um, which is basically um, it's another uh, political statement as a Marrakesh proclamation, but is uh, a bit different because it's made uh, actually uh, was proposed by the two uh, high-level champions uh, for climate action, uh, which are Laurence Tubiana and Harim El Aite. Uh, from Morocco, and uh, this um, partnership for global climate action is very important because, uh, for the first time, it engages the, the non-state actors into the um, into the negotiations and into the financial, uh, let's say, need for uh, for um, for reaching the Paris Agreement goal. And the calls this partnership calls for a much larger global scale mobilization in infrastructure finance, and as high as. Uh, six trillion dollars per year over the next 15 years so basically up to 2030 and uh, and this uh, this calls uh, this uh, sorry this partnership also calls for an incremental upfront investment cost uh, in infrastructure finance uh, so both mitigation and adaptation finance adding five percent of the total investment needed so these are, you know, the two, let's say, the two new sets made by this political statement that were the final declarations made at Marrakesh. But now, uh, what um, about uh, the negotiations that were made uh, uh, during the two weeks of uh, COP22? There are um, some important um, uh, documents that were issued. Uh, one was uh, issued by the Standing, uh, Standing Committee on Finance, 
uh, which assists the confidence of the parties in measuring, reporting, and, verif and verifying uh, the climate finance uh, uh, goal. Uh, and this uh, uh, actually it does its by biennial assessments. And in Marrakesh, uh, um, it was uh, issued the 2016 biennial assessments, which refers to 2013-2014 years. And um, this uh, assessment was uh, was important because uh, um, it worked on four different uh, very important uh, elements were tracking and reporting, so basically uh, gives a lot of importance to uh, transparency in the climate uh, in the climate finance flows. Um, made available the multilateral development goals uh, and also multilateral development funds uh, data uh, through um, the Development Assistance Committee and the OECD. And also applied uh, for common principles for tracking mitigation and adaptation finance because there's still, um, I mean, before this there was still um, non, uh, non, let's say, non-shared uh, principles on how to track uh, because, as we know, it's, it's much easier to track mitigation than adaptation finance, but then we'll see later. So, and fi finally, uh, it also made available data on uh, climate co-financing flows, which is uh, a very uh, important share on the international uh, climate finance agenda. And so, what are the findings of this uh, biennial assessment? Um, the first is that uh, um, it, um, it assessed that the, the global climate-related uh, uh, finance uh, flows is uh, up to uh, in, uh, in so in the years in the references so 2013 2014 is an average of uh, 7 uh, 14 uh, billion dollar <coughs> which, which are divided uh, between mitigation and adaptation mitigation at the lion share 70 percent and adaptation 25 percent the five percent uh, um, <coughs> which is uh, out of this is basically the co-finance and uh, sorry, co-finance, uh, co-adaptation uh, and mitigation projects. So projects that tackle both mitigation and adaptation. And uh, of this mitigation finance, of the 70%, the most, the lion's share for uh, private investments uh, were made, sorry, the lion's share for mitigation finance was made by private investments in renewable energy and energy, energy efficiency um, projects. And uh, very important was, uh, among, among the findings of this assessment, was that the mo most of the climate finance uh, is actually um, mobilized and deployed domestically. So there's not, uh, uh, there's not, there are no, so it's not uh, flows from developed to developing countries, but it's basically developed to developed countries and within the country, so nationally which was a very, very important uh, uh, finding uh, in, uh, in this scope. And, um, and then, uh, uh, well, the question of ownership, uh, which is very important. So the fact that uh, national banks are very important for this climate finance um, issues and for reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement. So the involvement of national development banks, this is very important. Then we see some uh, um, decisions that were made uh, uh, by the Green Climate Fund on this issue. And the alignment with the NDCs. So the fact that the NDCs is recognized as the uh, target, as the target, so, so the targets of the NDCs are very important in the in the um, in the scope of uh, of climate finance. This is just to uh, give you. Uh, it's not uh, comparable uh, numbers here. It's just an illustrative uh, to just to let you know how much is. The, so we see here the 714 billion dollars of climate finance, as we see. But we we see that the infrastructure finance needs the one that the partnership. Um, the, the partnership from uh, uh, high-level champions uh, called for the six trillion dollars uh, in the next uh, 15 years uh, is uh, is very much. Uh, and uh, here uh, on the on the uh, down uh, here we can see that uh, the cost for uh, energy uh, indices for so getting targets of mitigation indices in the indices uh, is up to 1.1 trillion per year. Um, so. This is just to give you some uh, some numbers, and uh, so um, just briefly, um, there were um, in, in Marrakesh there were decided two uh, important uh, uh, initiative and uh, uh, and the partnership. One is the uh, capacity building initiative for transparency, that uh, was uh, called by the Paris Agreement at COP21. Um, uh, the COP21 request the Global Environment Facility one of the operating entity of the Paris Agreement to support this, the establishment of this uh, 
uh, initiative for transparency. So again, transparency is a very important issue that were ta was tackled at uh, Marrakesh, and this one um, one of the output. And another um, partnership that was uh, launched in Marrakesh is the NDC partnership, which basically aims to translate the NDCs into investment ready ve ready vehicles. So again really um, focusing on NDCs as most important, uh, um, let's say, target where to make finance flow, flowing. And uh, this was made by engaging more, uh, by calling for more engagement of the private sector, uh, private finance, and uh, making donors more responsive to countries' needs, and on the other side, making the recipient countries more aware of funding opportunities. Uh, this initiative was co-chaired by uh, Morocco and Germany, and, uh, and in this context, the Germany uh, was um, like they told to this opportunity to announce uh, the, the raise of the international climate finance from 2.7 billion to 4 billion dollars, uh, euros by 2020. So, uh, okay, now the operating entities play a very important role, and uh, uh, of course for the finance uh, um, for the financial financing framework of the Paris Agreement and at Marrakesh. Um, the Jeff, uh, let's say they were made some uh, some announcements and also some uh, you know um, assessment of what has been done in uh, in the previous years. And uh, uh, the most important is that the bring uh, the the Jeff uh, is uh, is projected to invest three. So lo let's say announce that uh, wants to uh, invest three billion uh, in climate finance in the next. I mean up to 2018. And, uh, and that the Green Climate Fund has allocated already 1.2 billion so of, uh, of uh, dollars, yes, dollars for um, 37 countries uh, in uh, 27 projects in 37 countries. And the most important thing that is that the Green Climate Fund reached a ratio of 1.15. What does it mean? It means uh, that uh, one, um, let's say up to one of private invest or up to to one of uh, uh, green climate investments, so basically uh, public money, then it was raised up to 50%, 15% more of private investment. So this is a very important because, as we know, private investment is, is fundamental to um, for any um, uh, for reaching the, the target uh, to the Paris uh, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, without private private finance, uh, public funding is not uh, is not in reach. So uh, other two little important little things that I'd like to raise is, uh, and then I will I will show you um, a chart here that I've prepared with uh, it's a bit a bit too small, so maybe. But just to let you know, um, these are all the projects that have been uh, um, not yet dispersed but uh, financed already by the Green Climate Fund uh, in 2016. So basically, the first year of uh, which the fund was capitalized. Uh, so, and uh, one very important, uh, it's divided by mitigation and adaptation, as you can see, of the projects, it's because, uh, as, uh, as I said, it's really the Green Climate Fund needs to, um, needs to work on mitigation and adaptation 50% uh, uh, each, and it's distributed geographically, and, um, and then, as we can see, there's this co-financing, the, 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 the last uh, line before the last. Uh, the co-financing uh, is, is very important. As we can see, the first one, the first line on the top, is uh, this project, which is uh, uh, basically whose accredited entity is the Deutsche Bank, and is uh, is aimed to um, mitigation. So basically, for uh, for um, uh, energy access in sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, up to 73% uh, will be uh, given by Deutsche Bank and only 30% by the Green Climate Fund. So this is just to give you a, a, a framework of how co-financing is very important in this, uh, in this uh, play. Um, then also the role of multilateral development banks. Uh, at COP22, uh, there were many uh, announcements by, by them. Uh, one of them was the World Bank announced this uh, new uh, initiative, the MENA Climate Action uh, Plan. And uh, this is aimed at doubling basically the, the World Bank financing dedicated to climate action up to $1.5 billion per year by 2020. And then the African Development Bank uh, and the GEF that reiterated their commitment to support the African countries uh, both in uh, um, mitigation and uh, in adaptation, but mainly on urban resilience. So it's mainly on adaptation finance this time. And um, so, 
the most contentious issues, although, was adaptation. So, as already uh, Elisa was describing you, uh, with also the, the question of uh, um, of the adaptation fund. The only, let's say, I would say that the only positive track on the adaptation side is that uh, finally the Paris Agreement was, uh, uh, sorry, the adaptation fund uh, was uh, uh, decided uh, that should serve the Paris Agreement. This is not Insta. This is as well as the Kyoto Protocol. So apart from uh, the, the problem of not coinciding countries, such as the United States, which are um, only part of the Paris Agreement, but not of the Kyoto Protocol, but this is something very important, because it means that finally adaptation is really something that uh, uh, is taking into consideration in the Paris Agreement, and the Paris Agreement can decide to uh, make financial flows to adaptation as well. And second, uh, another positive sign on the adaptation financing is that um, the adaptation financing set the target of 80 million um, uh, per year. Uh, so, sorry, 80 million in 2016, and this was reached and uh, just in Marrakesh, where um, Germany, Sweden, Italy, and Belgium made other uh, commitments and other pledges towards uh, adaptation finance. So, this is something important. Now, I, I finish. I leave the floor to Lara for her presentation. So, hello, good afternoon. My name is uh, Lara Levy Reis. I'll be presenting work we have been doing on transparency, policy, surveillance, and effort levels, so on the comparability between countries. So, why is this transparency so important? So, the, the, the Paris Agreement opened this new pledging review approach, and in this pledging review approach, uh, the trust, trust between uh, countries is very important. So that that is why is it important? It's important to be transparent on the way we compare the indices and on the way we we set our effort levels. So just to give you a context, so in the Paris Agreement, as as Elisa already said, so we've seen that the aggregate effort level is not enough to reach the two degrees. Certainly not enough to reach the 1.5. So we managed to bend the curve a little bit, the curve of the global greenhouse emissions a little bit, but not enough. So this is what we already know from the INDCs, and they have not been, there's not have been a huge, uh, um, let's say, change of the INDCs from from that from Paris to, to here. Uh, so here in this context, I'm not going to talk a little, uh, again on this is not enough, it's not ambitious enough. We already know that. Now what we want to do is that, okay, so in the context of these INDCs, how can national energy policies and domestic policies help design, help our climate cause. So, in terms of technological improvements, of green technological improvement, and in terms of, for example, co-benefits in air pollution, for example. We also want to know, well, can these INDCs, we think they're not effective enough, that's fine, can, but can these strategies be made more efficient? And we also want to know what, what is uh, more effective. Is it just to set targets on emission reductions or emission re intensity reductions, or are these actually energy policies, these domestic policies, can do, can they transform the INDCs into something more effective, into something that brings us further in terms of mitigation. So in order to study this, uh, we use the WITCH model, it's an integrated assessment model. For this case, in this case, I divide the world in 13 regions. Here I simulate the unconditional INDC pledges. So the unconditional INDC pledges are the ones that are not based on finance. So in case, in case global... Uh, uh, global health uh, fails, countries uh, still pledge on this. So this is like the worst case scenario. So countries will still do this independent if they get financial help or not. And then, okay, up to 2020, I set the Cancun pledges. So we here we will include both the emission reduction and the energy policy commitments. This is just <coughs> to give you an example of the type of policies we include, the one that, the one that we call energy policies, domestic policies. This is for the three main regions, because in this case we focus on China, Europe, and USA. Uh, but we have these, we have a list of those for all the regions in the world, for every, every country we consider. So, for example, in China we have capacity targets on renewables, also on nuclear. And what's really important is that we have this non-fossil fuel share um, targets. For Europe the same, we have the renewable share target, which is very important. For USA we have also a renewable target. But it, we will see it's, it's not so decisive. It's not so important uh, this this target. 
Okay, so this is my scenario matrix. This is the scenarios I built in order to, to study the questions I, I posed to you before. So I have a BAU scenario, it's a counterfactual scenario where everything grows business as usual. I have INDC EMI, which is a scenario where I implement the INDCs, but only consider the emission pledges. Emission and when I say emission pledges, I include the emission intensity pledges. And then I have another scenario, which is the same uh, of the INDC, um, which includes the INDC emission pledges plus the national policies, plus the energy policies. Then I have a scenario that I call the cost efficient scenario, where I achieve the same emissions as in the INDC all, but in a cost efficient way. So I let the model decide, instead of, I, instead of letting the policymakers of each country decide on how they will reach this pledge, I let the model decide what is the most cost efficient way of reaching this pledge. And this is what I call the cost efficient scenario. Then I have the INDC GDP loss. So for some regions, what we do is that we, so we try to achieve the same total cost of policies we are talking. So the same GDP loss we impose on the countries, the exact same GDP loss, and we're trying to find the most cost efficient way for countries to achieve this loss. So basically what I want to know is that paying the, to the same total amount could we reduce less or uh, will we in a cost efficient way end up reducing, uh, could we reduce more or we, will we end up reducing less? That's what I would like to say. So now in terms of effectiveness, what I'm going to show here, basically it's emission reduction with respect to BAU. So the blue, the blue bar, so I show for the world and for the three main regions I have presented before. So the blue bar, this is in percentage, reduction to the BAU in percentage. The blue bar is the INDC all. So I have emission pledges plus the, the, uh, the energy pledges. The red bar is where I only have emission pledges. So what we see is that when the governments decide to not only pledge on emissions, but to also give some kind of route on how will they reach this emission. So when they impose themselves some kind of energy policies, the indices become more effective. So we see more reduction happening in 2020. For Europe, the renewable pledge is very important in 2020, um, according to our model. But in general, what we see is that we reduce more with, this, with respect to them. So there's, there's a bigger effort when we include these energy policies. They are important. So in the case where, so this is the scenario where I try to achieve the same GDP loss. So what I see here is that for 2020, for, so for the Cancun pledges, with the same GDP, total GDP loss, I could achieve more reductions in 2020. The same does not happen in China and the USA for 2030. This is an intertemporal effect. But for Europe, for example, by paying the same price, we could achieve more emission, more emission reductions. All right, so now let's look at the total cost of these policies. Let's look at um, GDP loss with respect to BAU. Again, the blue line is the INDC all, so emission pledges plus energy pledges. And then the red line now here is just the emission pledges. So we've seen that, okay, with the emission pledges I reduce less, it's normal that I pay less. But what if I assume the same emission reduction as the blue line, but in a cost-efficient way? And this is this yellow line here. Still we see that the price of the, the total cost of these policies is much lower when we let the model decide on, so in case there would not be these national governments deciding how we're going to achieve these emissions. But there's still a way that the world could pay less for the, for the INDCs. And this is this green line, the green scenario, which is a scenario where we achieve the exact same emissions of the blue line, but in this case we achieve it with the help of a global carbon market. So regions can trade emission permits amongst them. And this is the, the scenario where we lose less money, so when indices are less costly. So we've seen that national governments and policymakers, they do not always take the cost efficient, uh, the most cost efficient, uh, the most cost efficient policy. But why is this? Do they, do, do they want to, to, to give us a sign on, on something else? For example, on technological innovation of green technologies. So here what I have is, this is installed capacity, this is a percentage with respect to the BAU, so the blue bar is the INDC with the national, the domestic energy policies plus the emission policies, and what I see, well yes, the policymakers are giving a strong sign, we see, we see a huge increase in solar, also in wind, so renewables in, in general, in China we see a huge, we, we see a huge push for biomass, and in Europe it's particularly interesting 
because the, the renewable share is so important that we see that this is 2030, okay, that we see what happens is that nuclear, actually, the re nuclear capacity is reduced. This is because the, 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 the policymakers, well, here they are really giving us a sign on how they envision the world and how, where do they want their, 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 their energy policies to go. So these are the other two scenarios. So in the other two scenarios, there's much less, le much less solar, a little bit less wind, and uh, much less biomass as well. So here's okay. So again, policymakers do not do uh, the most cost-efficient policies. But what do they have in mind? Are they thinking about other types of priorities they have? For example, problems with local air pollution. So what we want to do here is to look at what are the co-benefits generated by the INDCs, and and look if they are actually helping uh, local uh, the problems with local air pollution. So here what I have, so when I compute all the scenarios I've talked to you about, I compute greenhouse gas emissions, but I also compute air pollution, air pollutant emissions, I, more than SO2. Here is just uh, just an example, okay? And so what I do, this is all the scenarios I've shown you before, but I add this scenario, the flea scenario, which is this borderline that, that ramps to the air. And this is the exact, so it's the BAU, but what I say is that, so in the BAU what I do is that I, I have a look at all the, the, the air quality policies that exist around the world and I say and I assume that they will be totally implemented and enforced. And then I assume an, uh, a continuation of this level of effort throughout the century. For the case of the, the borderline, the flea, the flea scenario, what I do is that, okay, air pollution policies will fail after 2015. So the, the levels of the, of the air pollution controls will remain at the levels of 2015. This is just to give us an idea of how many lives can we save by, by, by tackling air pollution. So this is the reduction we achieve just by implementing air pollution controls. And then comes the INDCs, the decarbonization. This is how much we can achieve just by decarbonizing. And then there is another scenario that can actually take us further, which is the scenario with trade. So we, if, we, if we implement a global um, carbon trade, we can reduce more air pollution. And we're going to see how this is important in terms of premature avoided, uh, avoided premature death. So here is mortality due, due to air pollution. This is avoided premature death. In the first panel, I have avoid premature death with respect to BAU. And in the second panel, I have with respect to BAU free. So this failed air pollution scenario. What I see is that amongst all the scenarios, for example, if we compare it with the, with the failed legislation scenario, it's huge. We could save up to seven, 750,000 people annually by 2030, uh, just by doing the INDCs. But and this, this, the, we are saving people, as you can see, mainly in the region of China and in Asia in general. But let's let's say air pollution policies they they, they don't fail. They 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 really go well, and that's really good. So we, in this case, we compare to the BAU, and in this case, we could still say we are talking about saving. A, about 200,000 lives per year, and this is annually, okay? Um, this is how much we can achieve uh, with the INDCs. So now this, this is this scenario, the INDC FMAC, which is the scenario where I implement a global carbon market, where I can achieve much more. I could, I could save almost up to 300,000 people, and in the case of the flea, I could save annually 1 million people. So why is this? So what happens, so here to, this, to the positive side is the avoided premature death, so the decrease in mortality, and to the other side is the increase in mortality. So why, why does this happen when I implement this global uh, carbon market? What happens is that the regions that sell permits, they reduce more locally. Well, these are the regions where air pollution policies are very weak and, and air pollution is very, very bad. So we can save a lot of lives by reducing Carbon in, by reducing, by decarbonizing where it's more efficient to decarbonize. These are the Asian regions, as we can see. But the regions who buy the permits, for example, USA and um, Europe, we see a little increase in, in mortality, but very small compared to the lives we could save in India or in, uh, in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, for example. Well, in these regions, the regions that buy permits, air pollution policies are already very, let's say, very reasonable. They they are at a very good state level, at a good a good level. So overall, by implementing the carbon market, we could save much more lives. 
in China, what we see is that mortality increased because China becomes a, a, a buyer. China is a net buyer of permits, so so it reduces, it, it buys permits, so it reduces less internally, so it reduces less air pollution as well, so there's more, the mortality increases. This is the same, but by a map, people normally like maps, that's why I put them. So this is by, by the way, I, we, we do this using the faster model, which is um, an R version that we develop here internally of the fast model. And so what we see, so in, in the top level, so here, we have the INDC versus the BAU. This is avoided premature death. And if we compare to the trade case, we see more avoided uh, premature death in India. It's huge, what we could say, by implementing uh, the INDCs using a global carbon market. And of course, in, in China, we see a little bit of increase. Uh, okay, increase in mortality means decrease in, in the colors, okay, in the, in the intensity of the colors. So in India, we see this happening also in the case of the flea. The flea scenario is so bad that whatever we do is already helping a lot. So, okay, so to conclude, can the indices be more effective? Well, yes, yes, they could. So we've seen that if we implement, uh, if we pledge emission, if we do emission pledges along with energy pledges, we've seen that we can achieve more reductions. We've also seen that we can achieve these reductions in a more efficient way. Um, we've seen that these domestic uh, energy policies, they can, uh, they, they benefit technological innovation, of uh, the green technological innovation, and we've also seen that the INDCs can generate co-benefits, and that these co-benefits are very important. And if we are to do, to, to, to achieve the goals of the INDCs in a more, in the most least cost option, which is the, um, the trade option, we could save a lot of lives. A lot of lives from from air pollution. Okay,